Hi, I'll be presenting today uh, some work that myself and my colleague James have been putting together, uh, working with chaining classifiers. Um, so the motivation for this uh, work has been that we've seen a, a reoccurring theme in cancer uh, biology, which is that uh, cell-specific programs, uh, specifically for embryonic stem cells and certain parts of the mesenchyme, uh, have been recurrently uh, errantly activated in, in uh, cancer cells where they really have no business going. Um, and so we wonder, you know, if you, if you look at cancer as a disease of pathways rather as, than as single mutations, this makes sense because uh, you, you want to you program this robust, uh, the cancer that can co-opt and that uh, in, induces uh, proliferation. So it's no surprise that it has chosen embryonic stem cells. Um, but we're also actively uh, looking for more of these programs, and we want to develop a method that can, that can detect this. So our uh, overall goal, that, our overall approach then is this. Uh, we learn specific uh, programs. Uh, so, so on the left, you see that we've, we've thrown in a bunch of stem cell expression data sets, and we feed these to uh, classifiers that we have inherited from the machine learning community. Um, and we, we do this through a system we call Wekamine, which tests a large number of uh, feature selection methods and algorithms at once so that we can choose the optimal one uh, for detecting a particular uh, expression profile. Uh, and then, independently, we take the cancer uh, expression data sets, such as the ones that we've got from you, the TCGA, and we uh, normalize them in the same way. Then we apply the classifier that we have trained using the embryonic stem cell data or uh, various other uh, data uh, to the cancer genome, uh, to the cancer genomics to see if we can detect the signal uh, then proliferating in, in cancer that is erroneously activating. Uh, so the first step of this is to uh, make sure that we have a robust uh, signal. And so here I've shown uh, each dot here represents a microarray that we have run through our classifiers, and these are two independent classifiers, one that has learned uh, embryonic stem cells from their early progenitors and adult stem cells. And then on the, on the y-axis, you can see we've also been able to learn the difference between embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells, which will be an interesting signal to keep, a, keep an eye on going forward because we know that embryonic stem cells are, are more... Are, are, uh, that Induced pluripotent stem cells have been shown to be carcinogenic, so that that signal may also play out in uh, in cancer. But if you can keep in mind, the the x-axis here is the one that we're we're concerned with. This is the one that we've learned that is embryonic stem cell specific. And so what we went, what we did is we applied each of that that learner to each of the uh, expression data sets that has come out of the TCGA so far. Uh, or, or five of them, I should say. Uh, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, glioblastoma, lung cancer, and ovarian cancer. And what we could see is that uh, there, is, there is shift in the mean uh, expression of the embryonic stem cell signature in all of these, uh, but the p-values are somewhat middling uh, except for colorectal and lung cancer. Um, so we know that this is not entirely true, that there is uh, activation of, of these programs in these other types of cancer. So uh, we went further and split it up a little further. Uh, in breast cancer, for instance, we looked at uh, the relative stemness of the different subtypes. And so, um, and not surprisingly, we found that while the luminal subtypes are not significantly altered from the normal breast tissue, uh, the basal the basal subtypes are and have a significant um, increase in this stem-like quality. Um, however, we can also extend this, this method to, to signals beyond just stem cells. Here we've learned, uh, so in, in this case we're, we're learning uh, on one type of, of cancer and applying it to another one. So in this case we've looked at uh, uh, breast cancer and we trained a classifier to, to recognize uh, luminal versus basal, which is a very easy task. Um, uh, we, so to prove this, we, held, we trained on 80% of the data and held out the, the final 20%. And what you can see is that th that final 20% held out 
uh, very well separates. Uh, it's the green and the red here, um, and red and blue are the luminal A and B. And so, so the green, which is the basal, is far is completely separated from the the, the luminal. But what's more interesting is that when we then go and apply this classifier to ovarian cancer, we can see that, first of all, that it has a slightly more basal quality, but also that uh, it separates the subtypes of ovarian cancer. Uh, the, the bottom graph is a zoom in just on the ovarian cancer, and uh, we can see that the immunoreactive uh, subtype of ovarian cancer has a much more basal-like quality than the uh, mesenchymal. So I just want to leave you with uh, one idea of how we're going to continue this work. Uh, we want to learn binary classifiers between each of the, each of the cell types available to us. So here we're pulling in the data from the Gene Expression Atlas, and we've got 52 normal cell types. And for each cell type, we're learning, uh, we're learning a binary classifier for one versus, one versus the next. And so this gives us, uh, you know, a, an upper triangular matrix of classifiers for for each pair, uh, and at each this is just to remind you that at each point in this binary classifier, we're optimizing on a, a large number of algorithms and feature selection methods, so that uh, we don't we don't bias ourselves to, to or attach ourselves to any one method. Um, it, it may we may find that in each of these tasks, a different one of the algorithms is more appropriate. So we want, to take, we want to be able to take that into account. So then a new sample comes in, say a cancer sample. And what we're going to do is we run it on each of these classifiers individually uh, and, this, uh, and find out its log likelihood of being in either one of the two categories. Uh, from, from this, then, we define a signature for each of the cells um, based on their performance in these classifiers. And that signature becomes, uh, can give us information about where it falls in the, in the, in the hierarchy of development, and also possibly uh, what the tissue of origin is, what errant cell programs are being activated, and uh, what other um, correlation to other interesting clinical variables. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank my advisors, Josh Stewart, David Hausler, and also the other machine learners uh, in my group, uh, Chris Cito, Artem, and Sam. And I'd also like to thank the TCGA and the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine for uh, funding. Thanks. Questions? So it'll be really interesting to look at um, how the uh, polycomb methylation changes that we see uh, interact with these uh, expression signatures. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we've already seen looking, pulling out some of the pathways, some of the main uh, you know, differentiation pathways and, uh, and the ones that are important in, in keeping pluripotency are very active in, in cancer, for sure. Question. Question. Um, this is Gordon Saxena from Broad. Um, how are you addressing the overfitting issue? Uh, which overfitting issue well, in particular? I, I guess in terms of that. Uh, I mean, are you keeping out some data? Yes. So, so each time we evaluate each of the binary classifiers, we uh, the, our our method for evaluating is is crossfold validation. So we use uh, usually you know three times five crossfold validation. Uh, and that's just a matter of selecting the best one. Now, then, then when but, but, we train but then, but then the actual, like after that, then yeah. you check it. Okay. So, so the actual, the actual final classifier that we keep is the one with the best performance in the cross validation, but is trained on all the data. So, uh, it will be overfit to that particular, um, that particular data set. But then, when we apply it to other data sets, is capturing the most biological data that we possibly can. Right. Okay. And then, then you go back and look at it when, when as more data comes mm -hmm. in. Yes. If there are no further questions, then uh, thank you, Daniel, and we'll move on to the next presentation.